I learned to work hard, so I'm not going to stop fighting to reach a goal no matter what. But never in the back of my mind, I felt that I was just completely out of the race. The Fab Five Part 2, Michigan Wolverines, beginning in 1994. If you're a basketball fan from any era, unless you've lived in a pineapple under the sea, you've heard of the Fab Five, a group of five freshmen who played for the Michigan Wolverines men's basketball program beginning in 1991 and immediately became household basketball names on any level. A lot because having five top recruits all headed to the same program was unheard of at the time. Known for their baggy shorts, black socks, and black Air Max 180 sneaker, ball heads, and extreme talent, the five freshmen created an entirely new culture in college basketball early on, and it translated on the court as well. They made the Final Four and NCAA Championship game as freshmen and sophomores, but fell both years to the ACC and top blue blood schools Duke and then North Carolina before Chris Webber left unceremoniously to become the number one pick in the NBA draft. Their overall journey through the Michigan basketball program didn't turn out so well. First, with Webber unaware of the situation, calling a timeout in the 1993 national title game down two with about 10 seconds to go when they didn't have a timeout left resulting in a technical foul and free throws that sealed Michigan's fate as back-to-back -back title game losers. It's a timeout that whistles the loudest of probably any timeout in the history of basketball. Weber fell out with his team and Michigan and made that his final game while the remaining four freshmen came back for another year and Ray Jackson and Jimmy King stayed all four years. Still, for better or worse, as we'll see worse, the Fab Five went down as legends in college basketball history, and the infamy didn't stop there. In come the Fab Five too, in King and Jackson's senior year. Another powerful recruiting class featuring another top high school prospect, Naismith and Mississippi Player of the Year, as well as first team All-American, 6'9 power forward Gerard Ward second-team All-American 6'8 forward Willie Mitchell, another 6'9 power forward Maurice Taylor, 6'5 point guard Travis Conlin, and 6'9 Massey Obaston to round out what many assumed would be the next best thing to come to Ann Arbor, Michigan. Only much like the original Fab Five, they managed to have all that talent and fall short of their potential. But this time was much worse. Starting with Taylor, who was driving a car with players and recruit Mateen Cleaves, when they got into a car accident and rolled their car, leading to an investigation into how could these players afford such a nice SUV. Come to find out, they were leaving Michigan booster Ed Martin's house, who gave them all money, including Cleaves, before they left and crashed. That investigation led to one of the biggest scandals in NCAA history, causing the original Fab Five's accomplishments at Michigan to all be erased. It also drove a further rift between some members, namely Weber and Rose, and almost cost Chris Weber his Hall of Fame. Certainly cost Rose his shot. Unfortunately, when you think of the Fab Five, that, other than the timeout, was their legacy, all because of Maurice Taylor's poor driving. The Fab Five, too, never got to the postseason and also had parts of their history erased amidst almost 20 years before Michigan would land on its feet again. Taylor and Baston would be the only of the five to ever make the NBA. Here are three reasons the Fab Five Part Two failed. Let's talk about it. It's your boy JC Stunning Growth. Let's get it, man. Take a minute to like, subscribe, and comment on who I should do next. Stunt number one, unwanted. The initial reason the freshman phenoms deemed Fab Five Two didn't have success is because not many around the Michigan program wanted them to become that, especially Steve Fisher, who in hindsight, knowing what eventually came out about him, pretty much knowing infractions was going on behind his back and saying nothing to his administration, most certainly never wanted to hear the name Fab Five ever mentioned again. In a press conference before the 94-95 season, he would go as far as possible to let anyone who asked know 
that having a second coming was never going to happen, not under his watch. Saying things like his new freshmen were not nearly as good as the previous five, they didn't have the hype Rose and crew had, and even if they did, he would shut it down. Also that some of the freshmen are struggling and probably won't see the court, and it's going to take time for them to ever see the floor at the same time. No one in Ann Arbor close to the program wanted to hear the name again, except the new five that initially embraced the hype. Gerard Ward, a McDonald's All-American, was enjoying being called the next Chris Webber. He was 6'9", could shoot from deep, and averaged 29 points and 10 rebounds in high school, being named the number one prospect. Maurice Taylor, also 6'9", was highly recruited and averaged 27 points a game and 13 rebounds and blocking almost 8 shots a game. A prototypical power forward in many ways. 6'10", Maceo based in from Dallas, Texas, averaged 24 points and 12 rebounds. 6'8", Willie Mitchell, another McDonald's All-American, averaged 21 points and 11 rebounds and second team All-American. Lastly, the floor general Travis Conlin, a 6'5 point guard averaging 21 and a half points a game. Together, they intended on carrying the fab freshman torch, but quickly learned that outside their own wishes, no one with knowledge of what was happening behind the scenes wanted there to ever be a part two of the fab five. Stunt number two, injuries. I really don't know what you know, could happen to me because uh, it's been proven that I can go down with some type of injury and I'll be out for Another reason the Fab Five Part Two failed to launch was because of injuries to their top two recruits that led to them both never having the college careers expected. Gerard Ward, the nation's top player, chose to attend Michigan, knowing the team had returning players like the remaining two of the original Fab Five in Jackson and King still on the roster, along with the nation's top recruiting class because he says to him he just wanted to win and go to the school that gave him the best chance. After 20 games his freshman year, he tore his ACL in his right knee, causing him to miss the rest of the season. He returned from rehab and after 10 games tore the ACL in his left knee, missing most of that season as well. Before the injuries, he was averaging just 6 points as a freshman and 7 as a sophomore. Not much, but this was still a young player that could have figured it out before long and joined Maurice Taylor in living up to his name early on and who knows what that could have done for him as a player. Mitchell would also suffer an injury to his knee during his sophomore year that slowed the former All-American down and further decreased his playing time. With Ray Jackson and Jimmy King now gone, it was supposed to be their year to lead the charge. Instead, main pieces were hampered with injury and it changed the course of their basketball futures. Stun number three, overhyped. Lastly, it may have been unfair to place such burden on those five freshmen, calling them the next of Michigan's most memorable five players of all time. But comparisons were too close to pass up. They had All-Americans, the number one overall prospect and player of the year, and four other guys highly recruited and much before their time as far as physical and skill development. Outside injuries though, almost all of them were huge disappointments even when healthy. Gerard Ward, like mentioned, was averaging just six to seven points when he went down each year and not until his senior year showed he was good enough to be a full-time starter. He averaged just 13 points and 6 rebounds his senior year, 97-98, and 2 turnovers a game. Not good for a big who rarely handles the ball. He was expected to be an immediate impact player, much more than Maurice Taylor, but a lackluster career led to him going undrafted in 98. Willie Mitchell decided to transfer out of Michigan because he wasn't happy with his playing time leading to poor production from the hyped All-American and landed at UAB where he averaged 9 points and 4 rebounds his final two seasons. He too went undrafted and like Ward became a journeyman all over the globe. Maceo Baston wasn't so bad at 10 points and 6 rebounds for his four-year Michigan career 
and was drafted in the second round 58th overall in 98, playing five seasons and averaging three points. Travis Conlin was supposed to come in and be one of the best point guards in the nation, but fell far from that, never averaging more than 5.3 points a game in four years, along with a career 3.8 assists. He was too undrafted and later became Michigan's director of basketball operations before resigning in 2013 to coach. They had the high school accolades, but proved much overhyped. All in all, they all got a college education to some extent, and Maurice Taylor and Macy Obaston still made the NBA. Taylor was a lottery pick in 97 and played over a decade in the league. He turned out to be the only of the five that lived up to his high school hype, outside of him starting the avalanche that would crush Michigan basketball for 20 years, of course. As the original Fab Five worked to get their name back, the Fab Five too fades deeper into obscurity over the years as not many even remember their time existed. Salute, much respect, but for these reasons, their growth was stunted. It's your boy JC Stunted Growth, and I'm out.